right, so what is it that inspires you and what is it that motivates you in your life? What is it that really floats your boat, okay? It could be reruns of Matlock or um, Frasier or I said Grey's Anatomy in the last service. Um, some sport, a video game, it could be money, it could be some kind of thing, but something that really just inspires you and really gets you going. What is it that does that to you in your life? But how does that relate to your relationship with God, okay? Is the emphasis of my life, is the emphasis and the goal of my life focused and related to God? And Paul set an example for us in Philippians chapter 3 is where we're going to look today. In Philippians 3 and verse 17, he says, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. So what he's saying here is he, he's saying, stick with me, friends, and follow my example in the course of life. You see, Jesus, Jesus is going to come one day, and he's going to stand before us, and we're going to meet him face to face. And he's going to look at our lives, and he's going to say, what have you been doing? And I'm going to tell you, it's either going to be a positive experience, or it's not going to be a positive experience. It'll be negative, Right? But are things in your way, things in life, what place does the word of God have on you and your life? You see, God wants to breathe hope into us, and he wants us to get busy preparing our lives for the trials that we are enduring and that we will endure, so that we will rise up in God's glory and not fall on our own glory, and that it will be evident in the lives of our lives and the lives of those around us. And even though it is hard and long, Paul reminds us to keep our eyes fixed on the cross. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again and again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. So we're in the middle of this letter, the book of Philippians, in chapter 3, and we're not even to the end, and he's already saying, finally. And what he's saying is, at last, and for the future, remaining here, he says, rejoice. And he says, I don't mind repeating these words to you again and again. Rejoice. Rejoice is a mindset that continues to be repeated in the book of Philippians. One of worship, one of assurance, one of peace and a, con a content mind. A peaceful and a content mind. You see, unbelief in a Christian, in a Christian life, is, showing, is shown as in Philippians chapter 2, where he says, stop complaining and stop griping about stuff, because that is a sign of an unbelieving believer. But on the flip side, rejoicing is a sign of a victorious life in Christ. And Paul says that he doesn't mind telling us this again and again until he's blue in the face. And you get up here and you hear, um, Pastor Bobby and Devin and Kevin last week spoke, and what do they do? They're all teaching us and all pointing us to Christ, right? We say it over and over again. So we look back. Let's say, look back to the month of March when COVID arises, and Bobby gets up here and he says, look to Christ. The world is coming to an end, people screamed. And he says, okay, guys, just look to Christ, right? Stay home and stay healthy. Look to Christ. Stop working. Yikes, that's scary. Look to Christ. Stay home and watch church online. Are we being asked to do something immoral or that's ungodly? No. Look to Christ. Rejoice in Christ. And now we get the opportunity. We get to come and we go put a face mask on and look at you guys. You rejoice in Christ, don't you? You say, hey, I'll do whatever I have to do. I'm going to rejoice in Christ. We look at the things that are happening in this world today, racism, and after learning from our history and our past, we still cannot get this right, can we? We have to have Christ. And now we talk about rioting in the streets of America and looting and burning of buildings, and I know that uh, a lot of people say, well, that's a problem, and that's, that's horrible. And if we think that, we're missing the point. And I'm not saying, I'm not condoning what's happening in the streets of America, but I'm telling you, we miss the point because we need Christ. We need Christ. 
And you say, well, I would never do such a thing, but yet we do. We do all the time. We reject Christ all the time. Even us as believers, we fall away from God and we turn and do our own wicked things. And so we are no different. We are absolutely no different than a rioter in the street. We are the same people. Because you see, we, you and me, yeah, you and me, we are Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when we rejected God. You and me, we are the same people that uh, God had to wipe the earth clean with a flood because we pursue our own passion and our own lust. We are the people who crucified Christ on the cross. So we are no different. We are the same as King David who continued to go his own way and do his own thing and had to, God had to bring him back. We are that person. And Paul reminds us, until we fully look to Christ and rejoice in Christ, we will constantly be distracted, about, distracted by what's going on in the world around us. Looking here, looking there. And Paul tells Timothy, he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, he says, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So what Paul is telling Timothy here is he's like, we are soldiers of Christ, and we are soldiers of the cross, and we have to stop paying attention to civilian affairs. And Paul is about to teach us two more things in the next 11 verses of Philippians chapter 3, the first 11 verses there. That we have two things to look out for, the threat of false teaching, these are a distraction for us in the church. And then we also need to be looking out and be conscious of our own condition. And that is the condition of our own self and what we are and just the conceitedness and uh, confidence in ourselves. And we know three things about the book of Philippians. It's to the church at Philippi, okay? And we know three things. First, the church of Philippi is, a pay, a, is facing, I'm sorry, persecution from outside of the church. So we know that Paul is in prison because of his belief in Christ and his preaching and proclaiming the name of Christ. And we also know that the church in Philippi is also suffering some, from some sort of persecution themselves. And we don't know exactly what this means. In the Roman uh, Empire at the time, there was an acceptance of different religions. But the, the Christians, they were kind of the new kids on the block, you know? They were the people that, uh, they're a little suspicious and distrusted the Christians. We do know that there were persons that were imprisoned and, and martyred for the sake and for the cause of Christ at the time. Something that we don't really ever experience in American Christianity. You know, maybe individuals, but as a whole, we have never, ever experienced persecution like they have in the New Testament times, or even that happens around the world today. I know a man that uh, was beaten by his own country in the Middle East. I know him personally. It was eight years ago. He was beaten for his faith in Christ. I have met people who smuggle the word of God into the countries that they live. And this is the kind of stuff that people do in order to follow and serve after Christ. And we have just no understanding of it as American Christians. We have been very blessed and very privileged to be able to worship the way we do. So we don't know exactly what the persecution was happening in the Church of Philippi, but we do know that something was happening to them. And number two, we know that there's false teaching coming inside of the church here, right? That's what we're going to look at here in chapter three. And then the third thing that we know that is happening in the Philippian church, the church here at Philippi, is that there's some arguing going on. In the next chapter, we're going to see that in chapter four, where there's a little bit of bickering going on between some of the people in the church. And Paul tells them, you need to stop. And he says to us, rejoice. And Paul wrote this, like I just said, he wrote this book from prison, <clears throat> and he's reminding us to, to rejoice. Now think about that. Prison at the time of Paul, we know he was under house arrest at times. There was a time that he was put in the deepest uh, prison cell, and you have to imagine that this is cold, damp, dark, dirty, 
alone, chained to the prison cell. And this doesn't compare to the humane prisons that we have today, which rightfully they should be so, because there was a lot of innocent people who were imprisoned during this time period. And this is a man who lives in this torturous condition, and he's telling us, he's telling us to rejoice, right? We just don't have anything to compare this to. But this is something that's repeated through it to us throughout. This is why we wear face masks, because I'm spitting all over the places I'm talking up here. <laughs> As this is something that's repeated to us throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Think about this. The 23rd Psalm, it's a psalm that we associate with funerals and memorial services all the time, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Wonderful! I mean, this is like blessing upon blessing. I get to go in the green pastures. This is like the way we live. We're blessed, right? But then he says, if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what does he say? I will fear no evil, because I know, God, you are with me. He's saying, I rejoice. I rejoice. The Lord is my presence and my cup. It runneth over. David is reminding us to rejoice, and this is a basic principle in the Christian life. And if we're still complaining and griping about the world around us, about other people, we have to reevaluate Christ and his principles in our lives. It's time for us. It's time for us to begin teaching other people and not being babies and have to be taught ourselves. And if you have not taken that first step to know who Christ is in your life and begin a relationship with him, I invite you today. It's as simple as admitting that you're a sinner, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, and then confessing your faith and your trust in him by just simply saying those things. Admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and I want to make you, God, King of my heart and Lord of my life. And this begins our faith journey, our salvation, our relationship with Christ. Rejoice, he says. It is safety for us. And then he carries on to show things to watch out for, things that will take your eye off the prize. Now, this is what chapter 3 is all about, is keeping our eyes on the goal, keeping our eyes on the prize. And remember what we talked about back in uh, what he said to Timothy, you're a soldier of the cross, you're a soldier of Christ, and you have your things that you need to take care of and not be worrying about everything else that's going on. This is our prize, this is our goal, is Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 2 of chapter 3 of Philippians, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. Now these three things are the same in one, okay? Now these dogs are not the dogs of like Fluffy and Fido and Floofy or whatever we name our dogs today that we uh, pamper up and take to Starbucks, which um, I'll just tell you right now, I have experienced that myself. I was in the coffee shop one day and it was rather busy and I was standing in there and this lady walks in and she has this big dog and the dog is rather, you know, out of control and she's trying to control the dog and then the dog starts barking in Starbucks or coffee shop, whatever I was in. And, of course, it's really busy, so I kind of stepped away because I'm like, I'm not with you. <laughs> and then the dog, this is the best part, the dog does his thing and drops his things, you know, his, he poops on the ground. And the lady then, finally, she just, she just walked out the store and got in her SUV and drove off. And <laughs> the best part is watching watching everybody else's reactions in a situation like that. Some people are like, oh, I want to help him clean it up. And then other people, can you believe people? <laughs> and I just stood back and observed. But anyhow, it was pretty interesting. But these dogs that we're talking about in, in Paul's time is he's referencing dogs, and these are scavengers, and you see them in cities in the world today and other places. But this was very common in this time period where the dogs run wild in the streets they're ugly. They're dirty. They're not domesticated pretty dogs like we have today. They're unclean and they feed on the filth. And this is a term that Paul is using that is also a term that the Jews would use for anybody that wasn't a Jew, a Gentile. The Muslims would use it for Jews and Christians. And Paul, so we got a little name calling here, right? Paul is using this term dogs to refer to these evil workers who are coming inside the church and distracting 
from the cause of Christ. He says they are evil workers. These are people who are coming behind Paul, and they're teaching this false doctrine that he says are trying to add into the Christian faith in order to be more Christ-like. And this is pretty strong words. He says these are the false circumcision. He's these, he says these are mutilators, okay? These are people who are coming in and see you have the circumcision that was established between God and Abraham. It was a ritual to distinguish the Jewish people from everyone else. And when Jesus came along, that was wiped clean and that was all done away with. And so these people are coming into the churches and they're telling these Christians, hey, you know what? You still got to do this over here. You still got to do perform circumcision. You still have to uh, eat certain foods. You still have to uh, do these certain things and not do these certain things to be a Christian. And Paul says, this is absolutely unnecessary because what does he say in verse 3? For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. So he says, we are now the circumcision. And so what does that mean? Under Jewish law, it was a physical act where you cut the, the skin and discard it, the flesh, and you discard it. And so now what he says is, when we accept Christ, when we accept Christ, we are now the circumcision. Uh, a circumcised ones. Our old person has been cut away and thrown away. Do you get it? So Paul said, we're now the spiritual circum circumcision. Jews say it's physical. The legalist says they believe that you have to do more in order to be more like God or to be closer to God. You have to do more. And Paul says he puts no confidence, no confidence in the flesh. So we think the world is all about us. And we think that we can do certain things and perform certain things and serve in different ways to make ourselves better for God and even better in what people view us around us. And we have been lied to and we have thought that it's all about us. We think it's all about us. We believe that self-confidence is all about us, but we can have self-confidence, but it has to be through God. Our achievements, our abilities, our education, they can all be, and they will be, a distraction for Christ. In verse 4, he says, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. So Paul says, he has all of the right credentials. He has all the reason to be confident in God because he has done all of the right things. He learned all the rituals. He learned all of the procedures and the, the good things that you're supposed to do, all of the good things that you're supposed to do and all the bad things you're supposed to avoid. He has them all. And then he says this. He says this in verse 8. He lists out all his credentials. Number one, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, I have been found blameless. So what he does is he lays out four things for us there that he is confident in. He says, I'm confident in my citizenship. I'm confident in my citizenship. I'm confident in my religion. I'm confident in my achievements. I'm confident in my morals. Like, I do the right thing, right? In today's terms, he says, I come from a good religious background. We all went to church, and we all go to church, or however you want to say it, to the religious uh, service. I was trained and educated in the best schools and even the best religious schools of the day. I played the right sports. I served my military. That's what he's saying because he's uh, he, not necessarily in the military, but he's from the tribe of Benjamin, which is a warring tribe. It was a very distinguished tribe to be from. He comes from the right, uh, the right place. I have a moral life. I raise my family to be good and to do good, and we fight evil, right? Okay, so this is what he's saying. He has the awards hanging on his walls. 
He is Time Magazine's Person of the Year, if that's even a thing anymore, I don't know. He was Employee of the Year for persecuting Christians. He did it all. And then he says in verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Paul says he has no confidence. He has no confidence in his religion. After he goes through and says he has confidence in all these things, now he says, I have no confidence in my religion. I have no confidence in education or ability or insights or background or achievements or education. Or for that matter, he says, I have no confidence in anyone else. More than that, he says in verse 8, more than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish, garbage, so that I may gain Christ, and that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. He now says in here that his only confidence that he has, his only confidence that he has is having Christ within him. Everything else is meaningless. He says it's garbage. It is garbage. It's to throw it all away because his only confidence is in Christ. You know, there's a really interesting story of Paul, and many of you may know the story of Paul, and I'm sure a lot of you, if you have been in church a long time, you may, may know, but if you don't, I'll share you a little story about Paul. Paul's original name was Saul, and Saul was from the city of Tarsus. And Saul, as you can see in the background and the credentials that we just read about Paul, who was formerly named Saul, so just get that straight, he has all the credentials. He came from a right, the right family. He had the right education. He probably had it made, in a sense. He worked and he lived in a religious circle, and he was high up in the religious circle of the day. And Paul persecuted Christians as a Jewish man, as a Pharisee. He did not like us, okay? He didn't like the Christians of the day. And he was on the road to Damascus, and Jesus, one of the only times in the Bible, one of the, or one of the few times in the Bible, I should say, where God appears to man, Jesus comes down in front of Paul, and he says, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting my church? And at this point, Paul makes a conversion, and he becomes a Christian. Naturally so, if you had an encounter with God like that, I would hope you would too. And Paul was uh, changed. He was a changed person. And we know that from there, Paul uh, left, and he went to Arabia, which we think is modern-day Jordan at the time, I believe. And he was there for about three years. And it's believed that he probably was spreading the gospel of Christ while he was there, probably learning. And then he comes back to Damascus three years later. And he has this whole idea that he is going to win the people of Damascus. He is going to go to these leaders, and he's going to go to these uh, people in the, in the political realm, and he's going to go, and he's going to go find his friends that he knows, all these people that, that he has contacts with. Because, you know, if anybody can win these people to Christ, it's going to be Paul, right? Because, he, man, he was one of them. And he goes there, and and of course, they didn't accept what he said. They rejected him. Matter of fact, they made a plot and a ploy to kill Paul. And Paul was, uh, you might remember the story, Paul was lo lowered in a basket over the city by some of the disciples to escape for his life. And so naturally, Paul runs to Jerusalem. And where does Paul go when he goes to Jerusalem? He goes and he finds the other disciples because he thinks, ah, these are my people and they will take me in, but they didn't. They rejected him as well. Could you imagine at this point in your life where you're rejected by the people that you want to win, and you're rejected by the people who you've come to serve with? And Paul is all alone, and he goes to God, and God sends him back to Tarsus. 
And we believe that Paul is there for years. I'm not sure how many years Paul was there. It was several years. Some believe it's up to 10 years um, that Paul was in Tarsus. And we don't hear a lot from Paul in those years. And I think, I really believe that it's common perception that Paul's life changed when he was converted on the road to Damascus. But I believe that Paul's life, which it was changed when he was on the road to Damascus, but I believe that Paul really changed, his life really changed when he was all alone and he was in Tarsus by himself, alone with God. Why? Because it was there that he probably started to realize these things, that all the things that he thought were valuable to him, all the things that he thought were a gain to him, all the things that he thought was going to make him a successful Christian and a successful missionary, that it, it just was dumped on him, and he realized that none of it is valuable to him. And the only thing that he can count on is God. The only thing. And maybe it was this in verse 7 where he says, whatever those things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. We know that at Paul's conversion that he stopped persecuting Christians, but we don't know that he really changed anything else in his life. And it's the same thing for you and I. We can begin a relationship with Christ, but yet we are still a baby when we begin a relationship with Christ. We don't instantaneously become more mature Christians. And that is what he's telling us to do. He's telling us that we have to continue to work and to keep our eyes focused on Christ in order to become more mature. And that is what Paul is encouraging us to do. And from there, in that town of Tarsus, at Paul, and his life began to change, and his life began to take shape, and his life would be built by God. That from there he would carry on to become one of the greatest missionaries that we ever have known. A man that we read from today, his principles in the New Testament. A man that we have learned how to pray from. You see, Paul learned something very, very valuable. He learned something that is one of the best secrets to our Christian faith. It's a secret. Are you guys ready for it? We cannot serve two masters. We cannot serve two masters. And Paul was serving, trying to serve God, but yet he was still trying to serve the master of himself. We think more education, more money, more things. We even think that more prayer and Bible study would sound good, but those things make us confident in ourselves. They never make us a better servant of God. We continue to try to put confidence in our flesh, and God wants us to realize that we only need Christ. We only need Christ in our lives. That's the only thing that we have to have. We have to make Him the master of our lives, and once we make Him the master of our lives, then we are called, we, we are called to more prayer, and that's when we are called to read God's Word and for Him to be able to speak to us and for us to comprehend it. And those are used as instruments for us to draw closer to him. And then in verse 9, it says, That I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, and I may know the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. You see, I don't become good with God by doing the right things. I don't become good with God by doing the right things. But I begin to do the right things because Christ is now in me. The question for you is, do you try to stay busy trying to show the world what you're doing for Christ? It's such an easy trap to fall into. We do it all the time. I do it. Oh, I'm doing this, and I do this, and I do this. But are we content in showing the world what Christ can do or what Christ is doing in our lives? And if that means sitting alone in despair and God to work in my heart and make me humble 
so that I recognize that I cannot do anything without him. I can't do anything on my own without him. There's a big difference. I want you to list your assets. What is important to you in your life? Is it your success? Is it your background? Is it your education? Is it your GPA? Is it your money? Is it your beauty or hair, which I think is overrated? <laughs> Just saying. Is it your personality? Is it the training that you have? Is it moral standing? I'm a good person. No, I count on that because I'm a good person. Are these things important to you? And if that were to go away tomorrow and you were left with nothing, if you were left with none of those, would you still be able to rejoice in Christ? Paul reminds us here, there are distractions of things that do not matter. That do not matter. That we consume ourselves with. We consume ourselves with things that do not matter. And it's all over. It's so prevalent. You have an internet full of stuff that doesn't matter. And it distracts you. It's just like Paul is warning us of the false teachers coming in. We have false things coming into our lives over and over and over again. And we just, we just soak it up and think it's the best stuff in the world. And it takes us away from Christ. I like Eugene Peterson's translation of verses 10 and 11. He says, he says it this way. Paul's words, I gave up all that inferior stuff so that I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and I could go all the way with him to death itself. I like that. I gave up all that inferior stuff. All the stuff that's out there, that stuff is inferior. And I focused on the word of God. Because remember that God wants to breathe into us life, and he wants to breathe into us hope, and he wants us to get busy today preparing for the trials that we are in or that we will endure so that we will rise up in God's glory and not fall on our own glory, and that it'll be evident in our life, and it'll be evident to the lives around us of who Christ is within us, and it's hard it's difficult. It's never supposed to be easy. If life were supposed to be easy, then we wouldn't need God. But we have to work hard because we need God. And remember, one day, one day we will stand before Jesus face to face. And he's going to look at us and he's going to say, what did you do with your life? And I, as I said before, it's going to be a positive experience or it's going to be a negative experience. Rejoice in the Lord. We sang these words this morning. I asked Emily to sing the, word, the song, Blessed Assurance, because I love the words to this. It says, perfect submission. Now, I perfectly submit my life to you. All is at rest. When I perfectly submit all to you, all is at rest. I and my Savior, happy and blessed, watching and waiting and looking above, and filled with his goodness and lost in his love lost in his love. And can you sing these words? Can you sing these words in your heart that I can praise my Savior all the day long? Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Darcy said at the beginning, rejoice in the Lord again. I say rejoice. Paul says rejoice in the Lord. It is our seatbelt. Rejoice in the Lord, it is our umbrella in the thunderstorm. Rejoice in the Lord, it is our firm foundation, and it is the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the Lord, it is our harness. Rejoice in the Lord, it is our guardrail on the highway. He says, rejoice in the Lord, it is our safeguard. It is safe for you. Rejoice in the Lord. And so we remember these things, keeping our eyes focused and rejoicing on the Lord. We pray, Father in heaven, we come before you today. We bow before you, God, in just humbleness. And with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, I speak to um, all of you out there this morning who may not know Christ. And I invite you this morning to begin a relationship with Christ, admitting that I'm a sinner, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, and confessing those things with my mouth 
and saying, God, I want you to be Lord of my life and King of my heart. And then I speak to those of you who are unbelieving believers. I know there's a lot of us that have focused our attention away from God. And I invite you to come today, too, to turn your attention to God. I pray to those, I pray to God for those who are unbelieving, who try to serve two masters. God, as we bow before you, we ask that you strengthen us. Please help our unbelief, strengthen our resolve to turn back to you. You have so blessed us. We are so blessed and we are so grateful for you, God. You have given to us more than we ever could deserve. We thank you. We take these words of Paul today and we, we, we remember to watch out for the things that distract us and that pull us away from you. And distract us and distract our hearts. We love you, God. We worship you, God. We honor you, God. You are so awesome. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in the name of Jesus.
to sign up today for our next week's service. I hope you guys will join us. Um, have a good day. Thank you, guys. Rejoice in the Lord.